We're now live on Facebook. It's Chris Saxman with Virginia Free. Joining us is Dr. Bob Holsworth to talk about COVID, the 2020 election cycle, and the 2021 election cycle. Mm -hmm. Dr. Holsworth, what are you seeing now when it comes to COVID numbers here in Virginia? Uh, Chris, um, good to be with you this morning. It, it, it's a mixed story today, actually. So on, on one hand, um, the more troubling numbers are the uh, hospitalizations have gone up to about, I think, 1294 today. Uh, the pandemic high was 1625 in May, but about three weeks ago, we were at 796. So hospitalizations have gone up about 60% in the last three weeks. And that, uh, that's probably one of the problematic signs. And clearly there's also been case rise. We were getting uh, about three weeks ago, 600 cases a day. Now we're between 900 and 1,000. Uh, on the other side, however, um, in terms of the hospitalizations, there's still plenty of uh, ICU capacity in the hospitals in Virginia. That hasn't been overtaxed uh, and is unlikely to be overtaxed statewide. I could imagine in a couple of rural areas where we've had um, significant case growth, there may be um, hospitalizations that could have their capacity taxed, but statewide we're going to be we're doing fine there. And then secondly, for the first time in about a month, the or about the last three weeks, the uh, test positivity rate is actually inching back down. It's been 7.8%, 7.3%. So uh, today the governor is holding a press conference and the question is, what does he do? Uh, you know, how, how does he balance these signs? Uh, that on one hand, you can make an argument that, uh, you know, uh, cases are increasing, hospitalizations are increasing. Uh, the death rates really haven't increased very much. They've actually probably, probably gone down a little bit. Um, and then on the other hand, you have some, some positive signs in terms of, you know, still have a lot of hospital capacity. And we, we're seeing the test positivity rate inch down a little bit. So, um, I'm thinking you may see a little action on the part of the governor. Maybe he'll try to restrict um, the size of gatherings. You know, right now they're at 250. Maybe it'll go down. Maybe he'll do a little more, even uh, further restrictions on bars where young people seem to be congregating. Um, but by and large, I, I don't expect him to roll back to phase two today. Do you think this do you think that the recent uh, unrest in especially in the city of Richmond is that going to have a political impact on this because you see you know mass of people uh, protesting downtown um, obviously not worried about social distancing some people are some people aren't wearing masks is that going to have an impact here um, you know you know certainly they have a mayor's race in Richmond and um, you know obviously uh, Mayor Stoney has been criticized widely um, by, by the left and the progressives who don't think that he was um, uh, aggressive enough and assertive enough in um, addressing some of the issues that Black Lives Matter had raised. And then at the same time, you get a lot of people now, um, I'm not sure whether all of them live in the city of Richmond, who are suggesting that the, the mayor hadn't been aggressive enough in dealing with the looting and the vandalism and the like. And so he's going to have uh, opposition on both sides, actually. He's going to have Kim Gray, who is basically uh, arguing that the mayor has not been strong enough in preventing the, um, the looting and the vandalism and the destruction of property. And then you have Alexis Rogers, who's aligned more with the progressive wing. Um, but at the same time in the city, uh, you know, I think the mayor likes the fact that there's going to be a multi-person race, that there's going to be three or four different opponents that um, and the city of Richmond has an electoral college system where you have to win five of the nine districts. And I'm not sure any of his opponents uh, would be strong enough to win five of nine districts. So you could potentially have a runoff there as well if the mayor doesn't win five of them well. The question I think is this broader question that you raise is that does this begin to impact um, Virginia politics more generally right. than the city of Richmond? Um, do people begin to suggest that the Democrats have been um, too easy, um, or Democratic leadership, uh, the mayor and the governor, though they'll put in this mix, has uh, not been sufficiently assertive in um, putting down some of this opposition. You might see they had this weekend, 
uh, after the um, events of this weekend, the mayor held a press conference in which he suggested that uh, white supremacists were involved um, in the destruction. There were certainly white supremacists at the event who were, you know, more than happy to agitate. Though the people who were arrested, uh, I, I can't see too many of them uh, having been white supremacists when you take a look at their backgrounds as well. But it was this bizarre um, rally in which uh, people from Hampton showed up. Um, you had, uh, you know, people who had been involved in the Second Amendment sanctuary movement. They brought their guns. And at the same time, you had uh, some of the people who had been involved in Occupy Richmond uh, eight years ago on the left. Uh, and a number of those folks were actually arrested, many of whom don't even live in Richmond. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a crazy time in which we live, Bob. I, I got to be honest with you. And I saw the Richmond Times Dispatch this morning. The editorial board took a two by four to political leadership writ large, but especially the city of Richmond, because as you, as you noted, LeVar Stoney has not handled this well. And he was contradicted by the new police chief that he recruited and hired, who's the police chief said that they don't know where these people came from and who's responsible for the organization of this. Well, 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 they actually, they actually do know where these people uh, who they arrested were from. Well, you're um, they, sure. Yeah. They don't know where everybody was from. Certainly they had, um, you know, one of the folks from uh, the Virginia beach area certainly had been involved in the so-called boogaloo movement. Um, that's just trying to sow destruction um, and chaos everywhere. And at the same time, you can take a look at the people who were arrested on Saturday night. I'm not talking about the Sunday night arrest, which I think were, were quite different. Um, but the Saturday night arrest, when you had the vandalism and you had the looting, and they had a number of people arrested, some of whom had been involved in uh, the Occupy Richmond movement eight years ago, and some of whom were not even from the area. But um, certainly, um, if you looked at their Facebook pages, you could not suggest that they were white supremacists. No, I, I, think it's, I think it's a mixed bag, and I think a lot of people are starting to try to find places where they can just uh, cause a little bit more trouble in the world, uh, express their anger. I don't know how, they, I don't know how this is going to you know, shape up, but it's, it's becoming obvious that I don't think the political leaders of the country know what to do with these things. No, they, they don't, because uh, you know, basically what they want to argue, and I think they're not incorrect in this way, that 80 or 90 percent or probably even more of the folks involved are largely involved for what they consider to be, um, you know, reasons of passion and interest. And then what happens, like what happens in so many things um, in life, is that people take advantage of this. And, you know, they, they understand that they can fit in with these crowd, they can come in and they can do their destruction and they can do their vandalism. I might even say that last evening, Chris, in Richmond, these folks were marching up um, Main Street and all of a sudden they began to um, break the windows at a very popular uh, bar and outside sort of brewery type place uh, on Main Street. And, other th and, and the protesters wound up in an argument with one another as other protesters ran up and said, you know, stop doing this. And some of the protesters said, no, no, we're gonna continue to do this. So th this is what you're, what you're seeing right now. There's not, uh, the protests are so, somewhat inchoate um, they don't have our organized leadership. And what you're seeing is that uh, different people want to send different messages. And um, a lot of people are getting very frustrated with the inability of the city uh, leadership in, the, in this regard uh, to keep a handle on things. Well, I guess my, my uh, initial question went back to, does the governor do anything to uh, clamp down on these relative to the spread of COVID? This is this is one of those areas that people really aren't talking about uh, relative to public policy because it rubs up against First Amendment freedoms. Yeah, I mean, remarkably at the moment, um, we haven't seen a huge influx of new cases in the city of Richmond. Uh, I'm, I'm beginning to see a slight uptick in the RVA region, but a lot of that is taking place in Henrico and then in the southern part of the region. Um, but the governor, you might recall, has been um, aligned with, with the mayor in a number of these areas, that particularly with the uh, removal of statues, the governor provided uh, the emergency declaration that um, Mayor Stoney then utilized to remove the statues, saying they were a public safety threat. Um, and clearly that was done in conjunction 
Um, the Times Dispatch went after the governor today, um, but by and large, still I think statewide, uh, the governor is probably uh, still getting relatively high grades with most people um, for his handling of the pandemic. So I'm not sure that he is in um, that much trouble right now. But we're, we're we're seeing things emerge that we hadn't we hadn't seen before. We see this with the violence and and uh, that are accompanying some of the protests both here and elsewhere. And then we're seeing, uh, I'd say in the schools, we're often seeing a, um, a divide between uh, the teachers and what they think is appropriate in K-12 and what a number of the parents want to do as well. Um, you might have seen in, I think it was um, in Franklin the other day, uh, last night or two nights ago, uh, the, teach the teachers had said basically they felt that it was unsafe to go back and the parent, there were at least a, a, a quite vocal group of parents uh, at the school board meeting saying, we want to go back. So we're seeing all kinds of um, tensions emerge that one hadn't um, even conceived of uh, prior to COVID coming here. Yeah, we're getting down to the, the brass tacks, if you will, on back to school. Uh, irony noted, it's Lori Laughlin's 56th birthday, the, 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 uh, the mom involved in the uh, the, uh, the scandal to, to get her kid into college uh, as we go back to school today. With this conversation is getting pretty vibrant uh, because people are looking at it from their own particular safety, right? I mean, kids, they want to send their kids back to school because it's good for kids, but teachers who are older are going, no, no thanks, this is going to infect me or, or I'm going to get it somehow. I'm less, I'm, I'm in a more vulnerable state. So there's that tension that's going to arise, but we're, we're, getting down to the, we're getting down to the final nubs here. Yeah, I mean, you even saw it yesterday in... Um you know, last week, in the, during the last week in Charlottesville, Albemarle, uh, where you have the local councils and the Board of Supervisors trying to pass somewhat more restrictive regulations about gatherings um, as UVA comes back. Because on one hand, uh, the folks there, I think, are very happy to have the uh, economic engine uh, rolling again to some extent in, in, in that area. But at the same time, they're very worried about the students bringing um, you know, back the virus, which we've seen um, in so many states, young people have been the, the, the recent catalyst. And so now that's what's happening um, there. And then we're gonna see all kinds of issues emerge at the universities because um, there's not a consistent policy across the public universities about whether you're going to have uh, virtual education or, or, or in-class education and how they're going to determine that. Will this be determined by the university administration that we're going to offer this many in uh, in person classes or are they going to permit individual faculty members to make that decision about whether they're going to teach in person or online and at the end of the day what does the student do if um, they come to campus but even while they're on campus three quarters of the classes are online um, are they going to begin to protest about uh, tuition and ask for discounts for tuition so we're gonna see a couple of issues emerge very, very quickly because these universities are coming back in two or three weeks um, to see how smooth that goes or whether we see um, some tension emerge between students and administrations over tuition and fees uh, dependent upon how many online courses they wind up having. Yeah, and it's, it, look, it's gonna spread. There's gonna be outbreaks on college campuses. It, it's just this, it's the nature of the beast. You saw the, the, the Miami Marlins had, I think, right. 14 coaches and players get infected, none of which were symptomatic, but they're going to they're gonna test positive. And that's, that's sort of the dilemma. And today we saw announced in the Wall Street Journal, Moderna and Pfizer are on final stage of their testing for their vaccine. So we're, we're at this moment in history where everyone wants to go back and do what they're doing. We have vaccines that are close to coming into the cycle, and people are still so tense. Yeah, and they're going to be that tense for a while because the vaccines, they're in the third phase of the vaccine where they have to now test 30 or 40,000 people for safety or efficacy. Um, so the couple of things that are emerging on the vaccine front that are interesting. On one hand, there's a lot of optimism that they'll be able to find a vaccine. So at, at some point earlier on, there was some concern about whether or not we'd ever get a vaccine because we haven't had one for certain uh, diseases like, uh, like HIV. Uh, but at the same time, there's now a lot of optimism they're going to find a vaccine. At the s still, um, what they're now thinking is that most vaccines are going to take at least two doses 
um, that you're going to have to distribute, you know, have to get them twice, get the vaccine a month later, get a booster perhaps. And then the question is, does it work with the most vulnerable populations, particularly the elderly? And then finally, the question is, how do you distribute them? Um, as they've been saying, uh, the vaccine's not the answer, vaccination is. And um, you have to make sure that that occurs in a timely way. And there's probably going to be all kinds of questions about distribution there. So in the short term, you know, we're stuck with trying to uh, negotiate uh, things that we have never even considered before, like uh, the K-12 system or the university system. It seems to me the university system is, as you said, probably a lot more vulnerable if you put people in dorms. Right. Um, and that's one of the interesting features that perhaps, uh, you know, of the 10 largest school systems in Virginia, I think the vast majority of them, maybe all 10 will wind up starting off virtually, but at the same time, universities, which seem to be more vulnerable to COVID, are likely to start by bringing students back to campus. Well, because um, their, revenue, their revenue models are very different than K through 12, and they, they depend on room and board, uh, not just tuition, especially the, the lower, where well, the lower endowed, uh, the lesser endowed schools. Um, they, they're, they're under a financial pinch, and they've got to make that difficult call. Right, and so, um, you know, most of the universities, they've planned pretty, pretty intently. They're going to have social distancing. They're going to have plexiglass barriers in classrooms. They're going to have, um, you know, sanitizer everywhere. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it, it's going to, you know, they have these strict rules about um, social distancing even outside the classroom. Um, but you go to college because of the social networking, not because of the social distancing. Right. And that's going to be the challenge is to um, try to ensure that that occurs. And at least so far, if we take a look at what's happened with the opening of bars and restaurants, and as you said, uh, with the opening of Major League Baseball, may not be the easiest thing in the world to control. What, uh, what's, very quickly, what's the timeline on a final vaccine in the, test, in the last stage of testing? Um, I think it's going to be that sometime this year, they're going to be able to discover whether these things are both safe and efficacious. Those are the two things. They need to know whether A, they work and how they work if, and with what populations they work best with. And then secondly, how safe are they? What's the safety profile? Um, and what's the safety profile with each group as well for younger people, older people and the like. So that's going to take about three months. So you would say... Okay. Somewhere toward the end of the, this year, we're going to know, you know, sometime, I think, in the October, December time frame, whether some of these early vaccine candidates actually work. At the same time, they're trying to ramp up early manufacturing on some of these and ramp up manufacturing of the uh, needed accompaniment, such as glass vials uh, right. and the like. We're well, going to have to see whether they need refrigeration. Right. Um, and those kind of matters. And then, of course, you're going to have to have some plan, some strategy for distribution. Um, typically in the past, the CDC has been involved, has been the, the key uh, leader of that. Um, at the national level, the CDC has been shunted aside a little bit. They're actually going to have a National Academy of Medicine commission, uh, camp, you know, uh, group look at this. And other people are ad advocating for some kind of national commission that would talk about what this distribution is going to look like, because that's going to be critical. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take multi-months. And then even beyond that, if you have even more distrust of government uh, and experts emerging, you may have, a, have an issue of, of ensuring that enough people get vaccinated. At, at least right now, I think about 60, 70 percent say they will. Um, and I think folks are hoping that that number can be pushed even higher. Well, six, I mean, let's just remember the 60 to 70 double doses out of a population of 330 million, uh, rough estimates, that's 400 million doses. I mean, yeah, I, and you, you know, it, 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 that's, it, it's, it's, you know, a, long, a lot of this COVID issue has been logistical in every possible way. Right. And this is going to be uh, one of the big logistical challenges for the government um, in every possible way, making sure that, you know, they do a better job with the, um, you know, the necessaries for the uh, vaccine than they did early on with the PPE. Right. Uh, they need to be able to distribute it in a way that's seen to be fair 
and uh, addresses the high risk populations as well. And then finally, they're going to have to address um, the folks who are just uh, skeptical of government and skeptical of science and really skeptical of vaccines. Right. That's a, let's, uh, let's, let's switch if we can to the political impact since the political science is your wheelhouse, Dr. Bob Holsworth. What is the, what is the expected impact in 2020 on voter registration and turnout modeling? What are you hearing and seeing so far? Because well, I think the registration numbers are down considerably. Yeah, registrations are considerably down because you can't run the same kind of registration um, campaigns that you normally do. So that's, that's the first point. And I think the second point that you raise is one that people are really just beginning to talk about, which is what in the world is this election going to look like um, in November? I mean, one of the big unknowns, Chris, is that we have no idea what the situation will be with the flu and the virus at, at the same time in November. Is that, is that um, you know, could they both come back at the same time? Could that really impact in-person voting? And what's that going to mean for absentee voting? We now have in Virginia, as you know, the no absentee voting, no excuses absentee voting. I think there's going to be um, far more people using that than ever before. But uh, by and large, what, what is that going to mean in terms of uh, partisan split? What groups are more likely to use it than others? What does it mean for young people? Um, you know, for example, uh, young people, um, particularly those in college and universities, often now vote at their colleges and universities in registration. You know, if they don't have those kind of registration uh, movements, does that mean they have to vote absentee? Much less likely to vote absentee, I think. So um, that's the big uncertainty, I think. The wild card of this election is we really don't know about the turnout and how that election is going to proceed, um, not only here in Virginia, but uh, all across the country. Yeah, and I think that is a disadvantage for Democrats who uh, annually have very sophisticated registration drives to mitigate the, the, the downside of people moving in and out of the state. They've, they've really had a better handle on that than the Republicans. Not that I think it makes up the difference in a presidential year in Virginia, but it's certainly gonna be an impact. Yeah, it could have an impact in congressional races for sure. Um, and, you know, so you have these two, these two features that, that on one hand you have the, um, you know, you, you have the whole issue of registration. And then secondly, you have this whole issue of absentee ballots and mail-in voting. Uh, the president has been, you know, adamant that uh, mail-in voting is, uh, you know, is terrible and destructive and could be a sense of fraud. Uh, typically, Republicans do better with mail-in ballots, I think, you know, uh, historically. Um, you know, if you're thinking about the military voting, how do they vote in Virginia? Uh, you know, many of them, you know, thousands of them, you know, vote by mail. Tens of thousands of them uh, vote by mail. And so um, we don't know how that's going to um, play out nationally as well. But by and large, I think the registration issue is a real challenge for Democrats, uh, not only here in Virginia, where I think it will be more important in congressional races and presidential races, but certainly nationally in these battleground states that they need to win, where if they look at 2016, uh, they didn't turn out their, their base voters as well as Republicans did. Yeah, especially with uh, the, the, the lack of enthusiasm Joe Biden's having with the younger set. While he might be polling there, the, the thought of them coming out and supporting Joe Biden uh, is not as intense as it was, say, eight years ago or even 12 years ago for, uh, for Barack Obama. And those people, have, look, if you look at those people, uh, the kids who are now, and I'll just take our example in our house, are, we have two more eligible voters than the last presidential cycle. And they're like, eh, they're just not, they're just not there um, when it comes to politics. They're like, I, don't, I just don't like either of them. And it's going to be a tough sell for both political parties. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, wh whether the young people get out and get energized and, and typically, you know, they get energized in part because of what's happening on their campuses. Right. And um, the question is, you know, how, how is that going to play out uh, on Virginia campuses and campuses across the country? In California, for example, um, you know, the California state system is going to basically be online. Again, it's not going to affect presidential elections there, uh, but it could well affect um, you know, congressional elections, and there would be battleground states where 
uh, these issues are going to impact the presidential as well. Especially in Virginia, where we have so many out-of-state students who now register here, well, domicile here in Virginia. Oh, yeah. And um, again, there, there are just so many issues that are involved if the students are not voting in person on campus, that if they have to vote absentee, it is a much more uh, unusual uh, task for them um, to do that, and, and, and a more complicated task. Let's switch over to Virginia politics, since it's always on high gear, it seems. We, we only take J July off every year, and we're at the end of July, so we're, we're, we're about to be back on. You know, 2021 gubernatorial cycle, the House of Delegates up, we have a constitutional amendment up this year for the, for the ballot as well. How do you see 2021 shaping up, given those who have announced and are looking at the race so far? Well, um, I think for Republicans, if Donald Trump wins the presidency, they're not going to win the governorship in 2021. They're going to have a, <laughs> they're, they're going to have a um, uphill climb no matter what. So the, the Democratic side is very interesting right now because it's so unusual. Right. Um, in this particular instance, historically, we would have expected perhaps a contest between the attorney general and lieutenant governor uh, for the nomination. Uh, maybe one of them would step aside. Um, none of that's happening. And in fact, neither of them are the favorite. Um, you know, we have uh, announced Jennifer McClellan, Jennifer Carroll Foy, uh, you know, certainly Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax. I presume Mark Herring is running, but he hasn't raised much money uh, about the race. And the, you know, the elephant in the room, of course, or outside the room at the moment is Terry McAuliffe who's raised you know, almost $2 million and is thinking of running again. And so it's going to be a, a kind of year that the Democrats um, have never had, I think. Um, there are a number of Democrats who clearly think that McAuliffe is a, you know, a shoe in if he, if he runs and he gets the nomination, they're gonna be supporting him. But at the same time, there's a lot of Democrats who believe that it's time for someone like Jennifer McClellan, um, who has been a sort of, a, person that they've wanted to run for statewide office for years to be the governor. And then I wouldn't um, negate the um, potential appeal to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party by Jennifer Carroll Foy. She's raised 700 million, particularly from um, the 700,000, 700, excuse me, <laughs> uh, 700,000 from Michael Bills and Sonia Smith. I think that 500,000 uh, from the folks who funded uh, so many Democratic campaigns uh, previously. So um, it's really, uh, you know, sort of an unusual situation on the Democratic side. I presume if Terry McAuliffe gets in the race, he's going to be a clear favorite. But um, by and large, it's a very different race. And, uh, you know, Jennifer McClellan is extraordinarily well liked among Democrats. And at the same time, Jennifer Carroll Foy is going to have a bit of a constituency, I think somewhat constituency in the progressive wing of the party, particularly those folks who did not like uh, Terry McAuliffe's support for the pipelines um, there. Republicans, are, I think, are, are, are just a mess right now again, um, you know, with uh, former Senator Carrico and, um, you know, probably the most vocal person out there is Amanda Chase, who if she got the nomination, we'd have a repeat of the uh, Corey Stewart elections that we've seen previously. And, and the real question for the Republican Party in Virginia, I think, is when does it realize that Virginia has significantly changed, that it has to find a way of winning in the suburbs, and that it has to look outside to, you know, um, to these blue states like Maryland and Massachusetts, where you have Republican governors who were elected, but were elected largely as Bob McDonald was uh, in 2009 on a, on a jobs, economic development platform um, and minimize some of these social issues that are just uh, anathema to people in the suburbs right now. Well, that's, that's, that's the hard part. Let me, let me since you, you covered a lot of ground there, I want to get specific with you. Let's talk about those large donations, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars from single people going to specific candidates and causes. Does, does the in this populist era, do you think we have a, an, an opportunity to ask what these people want? Shouldn't they be filling out economic disclosure forms? I mean, half a million dollars to one candidate is a lot of money. Oh, it, it absolutely is. Now, um, you know, and, and there are they're, they're monies that come in different ways, too. I mean, that um, 
you know, so, but, but what you've seen now is on the Democratic side, what they, what they have done, and one of the reasons why they've been successful is that um, they have completely changed the nature of fundraising in Virginia. So if you looked at the last um, election cycle in 2019, and, and you would know this well, Chris, what you found is that the traditional funders of um, Virginia politics, what I'd call the Virginia business community, Mm -hmm. um, the majority of their dollars, not in the entirety, but the majority of their dollars went to Republicans because they were a little worried about one party control of the state. Um, and typically that would have been a significant challenge for the Democrats, but it wasn't. And it wasn't for two reasons, is that A, they did extraordinarily well in the off-year election with small donors, but small donors from Virginia and elsewhere. Oh, yeah. Um, you had situations where you had uh, communities in Pennsylvania adopting a delegate race <laughs> um, in Virginia through Act Blue. Right. Um, and so the Democrats killed the Republicans and the small donors. But what was even more surprising, with the large donors, they also um, killed the Republicans. That, that, that by and large, you had um, situations where you had um, you know, Emily's List, um, right. sort of nas national organizations countering uh, and even exceeding what some of the, you know, like the NRA or, you know, groups that normally supported the Republicans were. And then you had the individual large donors, um, Michael Bills and Sonia Smith, who basically said, um, we're just going to donate to people that we think are um, going to be progressive on the environmental matters. And what was interesting, I saw this wonderful interview with, um, with Mr. Bills, where he said, you know, I just looked at this. He said, now I looked at how much money Dominion had given over the, you know, gave in a particular cycle. And I thought, you know, I can match it um, without much problem. And he did, um, and, and probably exceeded uh, wow. in that, in 2018, what Dominion gave. So. This has really raised that whole issue about money and politics and what it means. But what, what's happened is that the Democrats have found a way um, to get beyond a traditional weakness. That on, on one hand, um, you know, many Democratic progressives said, oh, we've been too close to the Virginia business community because we've needed their money. They don't need it any longer. They have found a way out of it. <laughs> um, and that has really changed the nature of, of fundraising in Virginia and is changing the nature of politics as well. Absolutely. And then one of the one of the problems for Republicans is they haven't quite figured out the model because they were so used to winning elections. They didn't have to. They didn't the way they redrew the maps. We redrew the maps. You didn't have to go out. You could go to the business community. You could go to the, 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 the trade associations, the lobbyists and get enough money to win your campaigns. But now the model has been upside down for them. Um, and. And I don't want to dwell on that too much, but let's just finish up with probably the most recent news relative to the business community and candidates. Amanda Chase was disinvited from the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce just for on an introductory uh, conversation interview. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, I think that what, you, what you're seeing is that the, um, the business community, uh, particularly up in Northern Virginia, just has no interest in being involved in these kind of the the social movement that someone like Amanda Chase represents, they they pref they, they would clearly prefer Ralph Northam and Terry McAuliffe um, to Amanda Chase. If you take a look at where the Northern Virginia business community would be, so the question is for for Virginia Republicans, how do they begin to find a way um, to muster some populist support? Uh, for people who could actually um, be um, supported uh, strongly by, by the Virginia business community in a statewide race. Um, they didn't have one with Corey Stewart. Um, and at the moment, I'm not sure they're gonna have one in 2021. Now again, if Joe Biden's elected president, we may see something different. We may see a number of different kinds of people emerge in Virginia. You know, certainly someone like Barbara Comstock has spoken about, um, you know, you know, spoken with some people about it. I think there are some people outside of the political arena who have um, connections in the business community who might be interested in running. But their question always is, 
can they actually win in a Republican nominating contest? And when they look at things like what happened with Denver Riggleman, um, they, they just wonder whether it's worth the effort. Well, it's and if the Republican State Central Committee was supposed to meet on August 15th, chooses convention again, stupidly, they're, they're, they just shot themselves in the foot. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that will happen again. And so, um, you know, here's a party that has, as I said, it, in, in races for governor, senator, and president, it has won once since 2005. Um, it's gone 15 years and it's had one victory. Um, and that was Bob McDonald in 2009, who, even though he was a strong social conservative, ran as a, you know, a suburban jobs creator uh, on and that I, front. He and, a nice and, guy. And, you know, he, here is a guy who, you know, grew up in Fairfax, lived in Virginia Beach and understood uh, the, the nature of Virginia politics, which has even changed a little bit and moved left since then. So again, it's not to say, you know, people, you know, I, I talk to some people say, well, the Republicans will never win again. I said, no, you know, look, they win in Maryland. They win in, uh, they win in Massachusetts. It's a, you know, the governor's race is the race about candidates. Um, you have to have the right candidate. You're right to win the right candidate and you're competitive, but they're not going to win with the, un, until they realize that in some fashion. <laughs> I don't think that concerns them. Even though Bob McDonald won by 17 points and Ralph Northern won by eight, that's a 25-point swing over over just 12 years. It was eight, actually eight years from 09 to 17. That thing flipped 25 points, and they still haven't figured out why they why they continue to lose. It's it's actually shocking. Well, it's actually not shocking. It's, it's becoming it's becoming so repetitive. No one's shocked anymore. No, I mean I mean you can go back and you know if you want to revise history, um, what if Bill Bowling is the nominee? in uh against terry mcauliffe um in 2013 is that race uh you know mcauliffe beat Bowling wins. Kelly by two points Bowling wins <laughs> i mean what's what's the situation there i think so, Bowling, uh, again, i think Bowling would have won that don't you well you know i think More i competitive. think at that time mcauliffe was not seen as someone who was going to be a, a good governor i think his reputation is certainly enhanced since he became governor, actually, because people think he did a pretty good job. Um, but he was seen as a kind of a little bit of a carpetbagger, an outsider. Bowling would have been a very, very strong candidate in 2013. Um, as I said, uh, Cuccinelli almost won. It's hard to think that Bowling wouldn't have won. Right. And I think, um, I think you're right. I think Bowling would have made a better statewide candidate. And I don't think Terry McAuliffe did anything to harm his reputation as being a good governor, certainly jobs, growth, and economic investment, which is what he ran on. That, that was his whole platform, was jobs, and that was it. Yeah, and, and, and I, think, I think he transformed his reputation, actually, inside Virginia, that he had been seen, you know, sort of an outside deal maker. He had been an operator. He'd been an operative in politics. All of a sudden, he's governor, and the state does pretty darn well. And um, by and large, I think he reminded me a little bit in terms of his promotion of economic development as a salesman for Virginia, like George Allen, yep. um, you know, 20 years previously. He just loved doing that. And at the same time, uh, for the Democratic base, he was, as he said, he was a rock on uh, most liberal social issues. Mm -hmm. And um, that, was, that was a winning combination in Virginia, uh, to be progressive on social issues and um, you know, promoting economic development and jobs on the uh, the economic side and, and somewhat bipartisan there. I mean, it, it seems to me, if you just look at back recent history in the last, say, the generation of George Allen to Northam, every winning candidate has come from the, you know, let's don't rock the boat with so much, make sure we're growing the economy and, and, and don't turn over the every affair of state into this big, you know, uh, kerfluffle, just manage the government grow the jobs and get the heck out of the way. I mean, that seems to be a winning formula that the Republicans, Republicans haven't quite figured out since 2009. No, and they, as I said, they figured it out in other states, but in Virginia, um, they just seem to redouble their efforts to think, uh, you, know, we, you know, we weren't sufficiently um, conservative on the social issue. So let, let's see if we, how, how, how much further can we go? Um, so it, 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 you know, it's, it's bizarre, but, um, you know, because parties used to be seen as um, 
You know, when, when I was taking political science and maybe you were taking political science, their purpose was to win elections. Um, <laughs> you know where the votes are. Uh, you know, hey. that, that, that seems to have, uh, you know, <laughs> somehow disappeared from the Republican mindset here. So. Three of the most popular governors in the country are the governors of Maryland, Massachusetts, and Vermont, and they're all Republicans. And they're right. deeply blue states. And they right. haven't quite it, figured it, out so how right. to win. You have, you have to be nice to people. No, and and it's just hard to imagine that that hasn't happened. But um, you know, I I think for many Republicans, they would they simply you know are hoping that maybe Nova was will secede at some time from the you know from Virginia, um, and uh, you know maybe they will never have to win there. But I mean, Tim Kaine beat Corey Stewart by two hundred and twenty one thousand votes in Fairfax County. That was a margin. <laughs> And here's the funny thing. I interviewed uh, Corey Stewart on, uh, in 2018 about his immigration stance. And I, I, he said, what we need to do is increase immigration from 1 million to 2 million a year. Legal immigration from 1 million to 2 million. I said, I can, that, that's great. Would you also take that new 1 million out of the current existing illegal population in America? He said, yeah, but I'm not going to call that amnesty. I'm like, oh, of course not. <laughs> let's, not, let's, not let's not do that. Yeah. Because they're, they're so trapped by their, own, by their own rigidity. They can't get out of their own way. Yeah. Well, I, again, so the question is, can, you know, when, when can they begin to do that? And, and, and the challenge is that um, some of the folks who would like to see a different Republican Party Many of the business-oriented leaders, some of them have almost given up um, uh, on that. They've they've just become, um, you know, they think it's problematic. Um, certainly, they believe, um, you know, they're they're not happy with what they consider to be the progressive direction of uh, some of the Democratic Party um, on business issues, which is which is different than it was, let us say, when Mark Warner was the governor. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the party doesn't seem to have an infrastructure. Um, that has been hospitable uh, to people making the kind of pleas in Virginia or the kind of case in Virginia uh, that has worked in um, blue-leaning states elsewhere for governor. And um, I'm not sure that's changing, at least. You know, in the and and uh, I'll, I'll finish on this note. I hear more and more Democrats saying, I wish the Republicans were more competitive with us so we, didn't have, so we wouldn't fall to, to the wide-eyed far leftist progressives in their own party. I mean, they're, they're fearful of their own party going so far to the left because Republicans offer no counterbalance. Yeah, well, that's, that's the real challenge right now that's emerged inside the Democratic Party. I think, you know, if uh, it won't happen until 2023, but Chap Peterson would obviously have competition in Northern Virginia. I can't imagine Dick Sasslaw could win another uh, Democratic primary that he only won last time because they were two progressives against him. Um, that, that by and large, the progressive wing has a lot of energy in the Democratic side, um, mm -hmm. that they are uh, the people who are organizing. They, they're not the only wing in the party, though. I mean, that, um, you know, th that I think that, um, you know, the Black Caucus is very, uh, you know, has gained power inside the Democratic Party. Um, they're somewhat more moderate on issues, I think, than some of the progressive wing is on, on, on some matters. Um, but by and large, um, the Democratic Party now is, um, you know, is not just a centrist party in Virginia. It's a center-left party, and the left is growing in um, is, is is growing in influence. Similar to what the Republicans went through in its, its own evolution. Dr. Bob Holsworth, thank you for your time. Look forward to joining you again next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Thanks for your time. Hey, hey, good to see you, Chris. Have a good week. Always take care of yourself. Thanks everyone for joining us. Mm -hmm.